All right, hello everyone. Welcome to Life That Extra. My name is Jack, I am one half. I'm the only half of your Life That Extra here in lockdown in New South Wales, but not for much longer. This is the last of the solo episodes. Um, Adam did one on the weekend as well for Blood Red Sky. It's up there on YouTube and Spotify now. Um, this is my last solo one because I moved into Adam's house. Never question my dedication to this podcast. That's exactly why I moved. Um, but yeah, we'll be back in the studio next, in the room next door next week. So that's pretty sick. Obviously, movies still aren't coming out. So I don't know what we're going to do yet. But we're going to do something and we'll be on the couch. Bants are plenty. I can start answering questions again. Uh, the least interesting and personable person on earth can come back and answer your questions. Today, the theme was nothing because I didn't think of a theme because I was moving house. So, um, Jessica, friend of the show, Jessica, one third of the You Like That Extra behind the scenes team, let me nocturnal animals on DVD. She was very passionate about me watching this movie. So I did. Um, I'm a slut for Jake Gyllenhaal, isn't it? Like, I'll just watch anything he's in and probably enjoy it. Nocturnal animals. Let me turn my head slightly and read my notes. Tom Ford directed it. Tom Ford is a costume designer. He's only done two and a half movies. He's done this, a movie called A Single Man, and then a short, which I didn't write the name down of because it's a short. Sorry. This movie came out in 2016, had a budget of $22.5 million, raked in about $32.4 million at the box office. This is a very arty movie. I feel like it probably would have had a limited release, but I don't remember. 2016 was a very long time ago, and I'm very old. This is based on the 1993 novel called Tooney, Tony and Susan by a man named Austin Wright. Apparently it's pretty similar to the movie. Pretty faithful. Listen to this fucking cast, man. Holy shit. Jake Gyllenhaal, Amy Adams, Michael Shannon, um, Army Hammer, uh, Isla Fisher, and of course Aaron Taylor Johnson, who, spoiler alert, even in a movie with Jake Gyllenhaal, Absolutely steals the show, uh, just takes it and runs away with it. Um, plot, I'm back to writing this one. Uh, Susan, an insomniac artist in an unhappy marriage, receives and becomes an obs- become- Susan, an insomniac artist in an unhappy marriage, receives and becomes obsessed with a manuscript sent to her from her ex-husband Edward, along with plans to meet him. It's literally written right there. Why couldn't I read it? Who knows? I'm not very bright. Speaking of not very bright, I don't get this movie. <laughs> I really liked it. I really, really enjoyed it. Of course, um, I'm a very simple person. Uh, if a performance or performances in a movie is good, I'm probably just going to say it's a great movie. But this is also a great movie wrapped around some really fucking great performances. <clears throat> Everyone in this is just unreal. But of course, Aaron Taylor Johnson steals it. Um, Closely followed by Michael Shannon, I think. Uh, Michael Shannon is the most criminally underrated actor in Hollywood. He's gotten a bunch of Oscar and Emmy nominations and stuff, but I still think he's underrated. I think he is just an astonishing actor. Um, So distinct, yet so... You know, in this, he reminds me of Billy Bob Thornton a little bit, but, like, less gross. (laughs) Um, Jake Gyllenhaal does his, his Jake Gyllenhaal thing. He does both Jake Gyllenhaal things. He's like the sweet, good Catholic boy and, you know, this this angry, petty revenge kind of guy. So the plot is, in the real world, Susan is an artist. She receives a a manuscript from her ex-husband, who was a writer, but he never really wrote anything when they were together. She just didn't think he had it in him. And, you know, that's not why she left him. She left him because, you know, he he was weak. He was weak. She doesn't say it outright, but it's because he's weak and, you know, honestly a little boring. He's not really a man's man. Um, you know, um, 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 she, she, like, she's drawn to him, atten- it, it, she's drawn to him at first because of how sensitive and sweet and romantic he is, um, but eventually, you know, she kind of comes to resent that and she goes looking for a man's man, a real prick of a bloke who just cheats on her and barely acknowledges her existence. Um, Her mother, like early on, there's some conflict. 
she she really doesn't want to be like her mother. She can't stand her mother. Her mother is this really classist, racist, sexist, rich old white lady um, who's only Laura Linney, who, who played by Laura Linney, who's only 10 years older than Amy Adams in real life. But, you know, turns out she's a lot more like her mother than she thought. Again, thank you to Jessica for that point because I didn't catch it at all. Um, I swear I listened. I promise you I listened to this movie. I was like, if I looked at my phone, I paused. And, you know, I know that takes you out of the movie still, but it's less out of the movie than if I'm just looking at my phone the whole time. Um, sold a bunch of shit, though. Turns out moving out, you, you just, like, you... God, you just have so much shit, don't you? Like, when, when you move out, you don't realise. And then you're just like, I don't need this. I don't need any of this shit. So I sold a bunch of shit. Or I'm in the process of selling a bunch of shit. That happened a couple of times during my watching of this movie. Maybe that affected why I didn't really understand the connotation because the big thing is you know the all, all the articles and stuff is like uh the novel causes susan to you know discover some harsh realizations about her marriage and her current marriage and her former marriage which i just didn't get i totally missed all of that i'm dumb as hell whatever but jessica told me that you know the harsh reality is that she's a lot, lot more like her mother than she thinks and she kind of just toss this blade to the curb for no real reason. The theme of Jake Gyllenhaal's character, Edward, just being weak and sensitive and frail, comes up in the novel as well. So he writes this novel and it's disturbing and it's violent and it's scary. And, you know, he never says that he's the main character in it, but the way Susan's reading it, she just pictures him as the main character. That's how she visualizes it because you visualize novels when you read it like I cast novels all the time it's something Jessica and I have a lot of fun with you know we cast the novels we read because I read books now okay I'm a reader I read books I've read two whole books and I've started another one so you know I'm not saying that I'm better than all of you who don't read but like so he he writes this violent and disturbing book and it's uh, sort of implied that you know the 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 breakup of him and Susan's marriage sort of fueled him and fueled this fire within him. He's this weak, sensitive guy, wouldn't hurt a fly, but you know it, his marriage ended because of that. So he's like, "Well, fucking, I'll show her. I'll show her, and I'll write this terrifying novel that feels so real that even us as the audience we can't really tell if it's real or not because." In the novel, uh, Edward, Tony, in the novel, sorry, Tony, who Susan is imagining as Edward, dies. He he dies at the end. And there's this, when, when he sends the manuscript, they make dinner plans, Susan and Edward, in the real world, make dinner plans. And the end of the movie is Susan sitting at the dinner plans at the table just by herself. She gets stood up. Does she get stood up or did Edward die? If Edward died, how is he sending the emails? And blah, blah, blah. So he probably didn't die. He's probably just, you know, nah, if you can't see the audio recording, I'm giving two middle fingers. Nah, fuck you, Susan. That's probably what he was doing. And he was just like, see, look, I'm not this nice, sensitive guy. You made the wrong call. He has a line earlier in the, in the movie where he's like, you know, if you love someone, you got to hold on to it and fight for it because you might never find it again. So it really does just feel like he's proving that point by, you know, writing this awful story that she's already an insomniac, she already doesn't sleep, but this book really consumes and disturbs her and, like, affects her in real life and stuff. So it feels like Edward, you know, knows that about her, knows that she is kind of all-consuming and a bit obsessive, and he writes this novel just to get under her skin and, you know, completely not ruin her life, but just drive her a bit mad. And it works. He does it. And then he's big power play at the end, just completely stands her up, makes her feel a bit daft, which she is. In the end, you know, she left the wrong bloke, probably. Who's to say? You know, Army Hammer, well, but he's like, you know, cheating and a bad husband. He's always in the office. Who says he's always in the office, but he's probably out cheating. Whatever. 
So yeah, the novel. The novel bit is the the meat and potatoes of this movie. I think it's, it's um, the, the best part of this movie, obviously, because it's like, you know, it's a, it's a story within a story. So, of course, it's like ramped up and it's, it just plays out like a really over-the-top, you know, revenge thriller, um, which is great. It's done really great. Um, that style of movie, I think Tom Ford has a really good eye for it which is crazy because this is only his second movie and then he didn't really do anything again after this. But he's got a great eye for this gritty, you know, out in the desert. It reminds you a little bit of Breaking Bad. Like, to when at the end when um, Tony finally gets his revenge and kills um, Ray, uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson, amazing, he finally gets his revenge and it's like, you know, he walks out in the desert and it looks like Breaking Bad and then he falls out and he, he shoots himself on accident, you know, and that's that mirrors Breaking Bad as well. So it, it feels, yeah, it just feels really scary and, you know, you really feel his sense of loneliness because he's just out in the desert in the middle of nowhere and then Michael Shannon's character, the cop, just is really on his side, the detective, but you find out he's got his own ulterior motive because he's about to die and he kind of hates his job and he's like, well, fuck it. I'm just going to ruin the DA's case and make this guy kill all the, all the criminals, pretty much. You know, just in his own... And, you know, you, you do sense that Michael Shannon feels for him and actually wants him to get this closure in the form of, you know, violent, fatal revenge. I just whacked the uh, microphone. I'm very sorry. So, you, and you get that, and you get Jake Gyllenhaal going through just the worst thing he can possibly go through. Like, the novel is, you know, they're him and his wife and daughter uh, driving somewhere in Texas for a holiday. Um, Jake Gyllenhaal's got this great southern drawl to him, but it's not exactly the same as Brokeback Mountain. Um, still weird to hear that drawl come out of his mouth. I don't know. Maybe I'm just so used to him doing his own voice. Or like an exaggerated version of his own voice, like in Nightcrawler, which I've watched about 400 times. And, you know, Aaron Taylor Johnson and his buddies harass them on the highway, pull them over, kidnap them. And then, you know, it comes out that he, him and his mates raped and killed the wife and the daughter. Just awful when, you know, the, the cop does his job and finds their bodies with Tony along in tow. So, you know, Tony is there when they first discover the bodies and it's just like that the worst possible thing a human can go through. But even still, in the book, in the novel, Tony is still kind of reserved about his revenge. He's still like, he wants to do it by the book and like he's, he's really terrified of these people. And that comes through in Dylan Hall's performance. Of course it does because he's an actor and he's an incredible actor. You know, he's hesitant when they first go up and find Ray. He's really hesitant and he's really emotional when he's like, he's saying, hey, you did this thing to me last year. And he's like crying and he's struggling to get it out. And even when he's finally got a gun in his hand with Ray in front of him, he is so hesitant to pull the trigger that it ends up leading to his demise because he gets whacked in the eye and he's all disoriented and falls on the gun and shoots himself. So, you know... That uh, yeah, so that's the novel. That's the real life novel. So to draw the parallel to the real world, I don't know. Would that have happened to Edward? Would Edward have eventually, you know, opened up and become this violent monster? Probably not. Um, would Susan have pushed him far enough to like react a bit more? Even during their breakup scene, like he's he's emotional, but he's not like outwardly expressive and he's just like speaking very matter of fact like no no you don't want to break up with me no 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 I'm good we're good this relationship's really good let's just keep going until she calls him weak and then you see this little like twinge in his eye just like there's that fucking word again that's why everyone refers to me as you know don't like that and that's why I think that fueled him to write the book and with all this violence and anger and stuff but he's like he's in a smooth mood like they're talking, they, they, they knew each other when they were kids, right? Susan and Edward. And, he, and he's telling her how, you know, she was his first crush and all this stuff, all these nice memories and stuff. And then she eventually says, you're my first crush too. And he just goes, I know. Oh, mate, power play. Oh, 
got to keep that one in the bank. If I was ever anyone's first crush, let me know in the comments. Kitty. Uh, so yeah, so in the real world, Susan, you know, made the wrong call because she's deep within her, you know, she just made the wrong choice, basically. And she lives with deep, deep regret too because she aborted Edward's kid. Um, well, but she ran to Army Hammer. I don't even remember his name. Army Hammer leaves. Army Hammer is so weird. Like, okay, yeah, he's a cannibal and he's now never going to work again because he's probably a real life cannibal. Crazy story in real life, right? Him as a man and as a person and as an actor, as an on screen presence, he just, he's like, he's crustless, plain white bread. Like, you put him in a lineup of other, you know, just white male actors his age, and he's really, he's not that striking, he's not that good looking, he's got kind of a cool voice, I guess, but like, I remember Hollywood were pushing, and they were like, yeah, this guy's going to be a lead, and then they put him next to Henry Cavill in The Man From U.N.C.L.E., and Henry, Henry Cavill just trounced him just tranced him and then he got Superman and now he's in The Witcher and the world loves him because he's a PC gamer. Henry Cavill is more interesting. He's just more personable. Army Hammer is just this like slap of bread. It's just so fucking boring to watch and look at. Like, you know, I'm not going to say like, you know, obviously I'm not leading up to say good, I'm glad he got cancelled, he will never work again. I don't think that at all. I don't wish that upon anybody. It's disgusting. But, God, he just leaves no impression. Even in the social network when he played twins. Like, the performance was not that good. He's just not good. He's just not good. Anyway, she runs to him when she has Edward's abortion. And then you cut to a bit later on. And she's just unhappy in the marriage anyway. She thinks she would have been unhappy forever in Edward's marriage. And when he really wanted to work it out cut to her current marriage with Army Hammer, he doesn't want to work it out, he doesn't give a fuck, he's just going off banging other people, and she's just like, okay, yeah, this is marriage, whatever, we have a nice house, pretty much. Nice houses, like rich people in movies, never have TVs or anything on the wall. What do rich people do? They have these beautiful big like lounge rooms with a nice fireplace. Like, surely rich people want to watch like, you know, Too Hot to Handle season two as well, you know? Well, where are their TVs? Why don't rich people ever have TVs in movies? Nice out. No TVs. Not a single TV in the nice out house. So, yeah, I guess, uh, I don't know, what, what's the overarching story? What's the overarching point? Does it need to have one? Does it have one? I guess, in my interpretation, you're watching me talk about this movie. It's my opinion. This is probably not what the director intended. This is probably not what the meaning is. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, that's the meaning of this movie, I don't know, I guess just, um, you know, it, it goes back to that line, you know, you fight for what you love because you might never find it again. Maybe that's the point. And, you know, in the novel, Tom didn't fight for his family and his weakness showed through, even in the novel, as Ray is tormenting his family and, you know, like, he's, he's kind of like... Tom, Tony, fuck, that, that's why my brain was scrambled and I stopped that sentence. His name's Tony in the novel. <laughs> but Tony, as his family's getting attacked, he's like, he wants to run in and get angry and violent, but he doesn't, he never does. He just like, he's trying to do what they say and trying to reason with these like redneck lunatics. And, you know, Ray's tormenting him saying, who's the boss in this family? It's not you, it's not you, you have a vagina and he's just, you know, all this sexist stuff. But, you know, that... I guess that mirrors Edward's life, you know, his internal uh, sense of what he is, just to rather what other people told him. He's this weak, won't step in, won't stand up for his family, won't protect his family, even in a time of crazy, scary crisis. Yeah, and I guess Edward's like that in real life, and that's why Susan left him. But anyway, he gets the last laugh because he stands her up at a restaurant, and that's pretty cool. I guess. Again, it just goes back to two middle fingers. Just like, ah, ah, you have to sit by yourself at dinner. Ah. 
Anyway, nocturnal animals, I don't think I've talked about it very much. It's been 20 minutes, I don't even know what I said about it. Very good movie, very, very, uh, you know, uh, intense movie. Um, just pay as much attention to it as you can and then talk about it with your friends because that's like what we're doing now. I probably should have waited till after we had the conversations and sort of worked out a overarching narrative or point to this movie, but I just rushed in and I'll see what Jessica and Alyssa say after this and see what they think and if they agree or disagree with the points I didn't make. So yeah, that's that's the end of You Like That Extra Solo. Um, it's been a fun few weeks. It's very tough to do these by yourself. Um, I'm very glad that Adam and I will be back on the couch in the room next door next week. That's very exciting. Um, so make sure you like and you subscribe and you follow us on Instagram because there's a link tree in the bio that takes you to everywhere we are, including merch. Um, so yeah, if you like that podcast on Instagram, just go there and then go to wherever you listen to podcasts or watch podcasts. If you're on YouTube, please subscribe. Please like it. It's a numbers game. I say it every time. It's a numbers game. we got to play the game. Help us out. So yeah, Nocturnal Animals. Very good movie. Um, I like movies. My name is Jack. I have been one half. I've been the only half of You Like That Extra for these few weeks. Next week, your boys are back on the couch. We'll see you then.